you got your Bibles, you got your phone, however you've got your Bible, go ahead and get that out, turn it on, do what you need to do. We're in Daniel 4. And we've been in Daniel for the last several weeks. Um, this is a series that I planned several, several months ago. And little did I know, uh, to some degree, how, how relevant, um, God's Word is always relevant, but I just, I marvel at how its message can always speak to whatever we're in. Um, if you don't know about Daniel, Daniel's a book that's about 2,600 years old, it takes place a little less than 600 years before Jesus, and it's, it's really a story, it's, a, it's divided in two halves. First half is these narrative chunks that, as I believe June mentioned, it reads like a novel. And in the midst of that novel, we see God using Daniel in just the most unreal circumstance. The unthinkable had happened. God had actually punished his people because they were unfaithful to him. They abandoned him. They went after other gods, other lovers. And God was faithful to them and actually let Babylon, this the world power of the day, kind of go in and capture the city, drag off all the nobility, take them back to Babylon, try to re-educate them, re-assimilate them, because Babylon's power was sweeping from the eastern part of the Fertile Crescent all the way across the ancient Near East, all the way down into Egypt. It was like Rome in Jesus' day. It was the world power. It was, you know, to some degree, like America, where just the military might that friends who I went to Bible college with that went to work in Hawaii and other parts of the country. And whatever you feel about our presence there, the thing that he said struck me, he said, it just struck me is how powerful America is, our presence all over the world. That's what Babylon was. Their military expansive might had taken over the known world. And in the midst of their going back to their homeland, back to their capital city, on the way they thought they'd sack this little strip of ground where Jesus' people lived, the Israelites lived, a very strategic piece of ground, the eastern part of the Mediterranean seaboard, drags them all off, and Daniel and his friends with them. And what we saw several weeks ago is that Daniel had a decision to make. Do you remember that message? Daniel 1 was about loyalty. Because Daniel 1 said that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, didn't kill everyone and wipe everybody out. That would have been not nearly as strategic as saving the nobility, bringing them back to your home country and retraining them, reassimilating them, taking everything away that would cause them to be faithful to the one true God and replacing it with the, their pantheon, Marduk and the other gods of the, the Babylonian pantheon so that they could worship and serve him, worship and serve the king, completely change allegiance and alliance. And Daniel had a decision to make whether he was going to stay loyal or not. And what we've seen in the last couple chapters is that Daniel 2, if you remember the end of Daniel 1, because Daniel made that decision to be faithful and loyal, God gave him a gift. God, God blessed him, gave him the ability to interpret dreams and visions, which in the ancient world, that was, that was the way that go, the gods communicated their omens. If something bad was going to happen, you needed the diviners and the enchanters and the sorcerers to kind of read the omens and tell you what the gods are trying to say if something good or bad is coming so you can prepare for it. God actually used Daniel, uses Daniel, to interpret messages he has for the king. Not the gods, but the one true God. God has things to say to the most powerful person on the planet at that time, King Nebuchadnezzar. And what we saw in Daniel 2 is that God the one true God is the one who reveals. You remember the dream of the statue that he saw that was crushed by the little stone cut, as it were, out of the mountainside without hands that dashes the stone to pieces, representing all the world kingdoms that were going to come and Jesus' kingdom that would destroy every other kingdom and set up its own kingdom to rule the, earth, to rule the world. So we saw that God is the only one who can really tell you the truth about the way things really are. He's the only God that reveals. Last week we looked at chapter 3, where Daniel's three friends didn't bow down and worship a golden idol that Nebuchadnezzar set up to, to solidify, consolidate 
all of the different forms of worship in the conquering territories that his expansive kingdom had, had, had overthrown. He set up an image to consolidate everybody's worship and expand his power. And Daniel's three friends said no. And Nebuchadnezzar threw him into the fiery furnace. And we found out that not only does, is God the one true God, the only one who really reveals the truth, but he's the only one that can really rescue. So we saw that God's the only one that reveals. And God's the only one that can rescue. And like a good three-point sermon that's going to start with R, God is the one, as we're going to see that, we got to read it, don't we? I don't want to give it away. I've got the hook into you. So let's read it. God is the God who reveals. God is the God who rescues. And Daniel 4 is going to show us that God is the God who does something else as well. Nebuchadnezzar is going to have another dream. And it's going to trouble him like the first dream did. And he's going to bring Daniel in to interpret the dream. But before we get to the dream, Daniel... The book of Daniel paints the setting for Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and the setting is important to the dream. So let's read the setting in the first couple of verses. Chapter 4, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar, to all peoples, nations, and languages right, in his kingdom that dwell all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. It seemed good to me to show the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace, and I saw a dream that made me afraid. I just want to pause there. Scholars, there's a reason that Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and the hanging gardens in the palace of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, but as archaeologists excavate the, the ancient city of Babylon, they found that not only was it massive, but it was so strategically fortified, it's a wonder that the Persians conquered them in another several decades. Babylon was built with two double walls. The first exterior wall had two walls that were both 25 feet thick, and then there was another 20 feet, and then another double wall with walls that were 25 feet thick. And outside of that was a moat that was a hundred feet wide that went around the entire city. Talk about building a wall, building two walls and putting a moat around it. And in the midst of that, Nebuchadnezzar had three palaces, one that he inherited from his dad, which wasn't enough. So he built two more. And in the midst of that, he put hanging gardens for his wife to plant all of the, the flora that were from her native land so that she could walk about and see the gardens not only on the ground, but hanging about so she could see all the wonderful plants from her hometown. It, it was the absolute height of opulence and power and wealth. Nebuchadnezzar's on the rooftop, and it says that he's at ease. Now, right there, at least in my mind, that says there's a problem. Because in the Bible, at least a handful of times I can think of, when a king goes to his rooftop and kind of takes a deep breath, takes a load off, he, what he's doing is he's looking at what? What is he looking at? He's not just looking at the peasants. and He goes up to the rooftop to see what? The city. Everything he's done. Everything that his power and his wisdom has accomplished. And he kind of goes, oh, look at that. Look at what I've done. We see several times in the Bible that whenever a king goes to the rooftop, bad things happen. You know 2 Samuel 21, when David goes to the rooftop. He doesn't see Bathsheba when he's just walking around through the city, right? He's on the rooftop when he should be at war. It says that all the other kings were at war, but David was getting kind of old, kind of tired. And he went out to just take a little breath, look out over the city. And that was when his kingdom went down. Bad things happen when kings go to the rooftops and just to just to go out at their ease and their leisure and have a look around. Herod the Great, Acts chapter 12, one of the most powerful kings in Palestine, goes out to the, to the rooftop to have a speech. And the people say, the voice of a god, not a man. And he says in the quiet of his heart, he says, he accepts the worship. And God strikes him down. So bad things happen when very powerful people 
go to the top of their kingdom just to, you know, innocently have a look around. What we're going to see is that's not so innocent. That's the context for this dream, this message that God wants to get across to the most powerful king in the world. Let's read the dream. I saw a dream that made me afraid, and as I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. I, I made a decree. All the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me. Does this sound familiar? This is Daniel 2. We're kind of recycling that idea. That they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in, and I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. At last, Daniel came in before me. He who was named Belshazzar after the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and took, and I told him the dream, saying, O Belshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is diff too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw, and their interpretation. And the visions of my head as I lay in my bed were these. I saw, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong, and it reached the top of heaven, and it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Its leaves were beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, and the birds of the heaven lived in its branches, and all flesh fled from it, what was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head as I lay on the bed, and behold, a watcher, a holy one, I came down from heaven. He proclaimed aloud and said thus, chop down the tree and lop off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but leave the stump of its roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze amid the tender grass of the field. Let him be wet with the dew of heaven. Let his portion be with the beasts and the grass of the earth. Let his mind be changed from a man's and let a beast's mind be given to him. Let seven periods of time pass over him. The sentence is decreed of the watchers, the decision by the word of the holy ones, to the end that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets it over the lowliest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, saw, and to you, O Belshazzar, tell me the interpretation, because all the wise men of my kingdom are not able, and you are able to make known the interpretation for the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Now, the first part of the dream is not that troubling. You know, he sees a, a tree, and this, this tree is, shows up in other parts of scripture resembling different kinds of things, but it's a kind of a cosmic tree. It's a tree that represents Nebuchadnezzar and his kingdom, and how everything he's conquered, as it were, is taking up shade in its branches, right? It's using that metaphor of the dream, and the dream's fine until verse 12, until Nebuchadnezzar sees that the tree is chopped down, and as we read the interpretation. Now Daniel, being gifted by God to interpret the dream, says this in verse 19. Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was dismayed for a while, and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, O oh, Belshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. Belshazzar answered and said to him, My Lord, may the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. I just want to pause there before we get to the interpretation. Because Daniel is displaying something that's really interesting to me. Here he is. He's an Israelite that's been taken from his home by force, forced into an education and a program that he does not like by a king that is ruthlessly ruling the world and a dream has come to him that is very bad news. And Daniel's struggling with that. Daniel's puzzling over that. Daniel's dismayed over the news he has to tell to the pagan king whose service he is now in. Rather than going, ha ha, it's about time he gets his own. He says, I wish this dream wasn't for you, O king. And I'm puzzled by that. I'm puzzled by it because on the one hand, Daniel should be glad that Babylon is going to come down and that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be punished and that the news he has for him is bad news. But he also has found a way to love and enjoy the, the presence of the king. He, he admires the king. He has, um, he has good thoughts for the king. And he has this mixture in him. He essentially says, well, king, 
I've got some good news, and I've got a lot of bad news. Have you ever had to do that to somebody? Or somebody came to you, you know, maybe recently, like at work, and they say, well, Rick, I've got good news, and i got bad news. Which do you want to hear first? Or as a parent, you've gone to one of your kids, or your kiddo has come to you, you've had to say to them, I've got good news, and i got bad news. Which one do you want to hear first? I want to hear the bad news, apparently. Let's get that over with, right? The thing that I find startling about this is Daniel's got very bad news for the king, and it troubles him. And to me, that signals that Daniel is, in some degree, a very good model for you and I when God calls us to somebody with the revelation of his word to bring them a message that is full of good news. Isn't that what, I mean, that's literally the gospel word. The gospel word is good news. It was a word that used, was used throughout Rome's empire. When a new Caesar ascended the throne, they would go out and preach the gospel. A new Caesar has come to the throne. It was their evangelism. But with us, um, and with every form of good news, particularly good news that's very gospel-centered, did you know that there's bad news hardwired into the gospel? Is there, you know, do you know why people don't like listening to you when you say, I've got good news. Jesus is king. But I've got bad news. You are not. There's a reason people don't listen to you when you bring the good news. Because if you really want to share the good news with someone, you have to share the bad news. And the bad news is, you're not the king. See, kings don't rule in a democracy. They're kings. They rule. And it's a matter of loyalty, as we just saw in Daniel 1. You know, you're either loyal or you're not. It's not, you know, I don't know. It's a loyalty thing. And the reason Daniel's model of bringing the the very bad news to his king is he's troubled by it. And I want to ask you, when was the last time you had the opportunity to share the gospel and it troubled you? It troubled, it was hot, it was heavy for you because you knew that to share the good news, you had to share bad news. You had to say to somebody who said, you know, I wonder what this is all about. And you said, I've got good news. There's one who rules the world and he's the king and you're not, and you can only pick one. Does that trouble you, or does that excite you? Do you get excited about rubbing people's face in the bad news so that you can tell them the good news, so that you can stand over them and say, and I'm a part of the kingdom, and you're not, because you're not the king. And you, you, know, you almost revel in kind of rubbing their face in it. If you do, you've heard the gospel wrong. Because even now, I have... I'm compelled, this has been a heavy word for me this week. I'm not the king. You're not the king. But there is a king. And that should be very exciting and troubling when we go to somebody who isn't a part of the kingdom yet. Because that means them showing their allegiance to the king is going to be handing over their life handing over everything, not just a little thing or a little that, everything. And that, to some people, they're glad to hand over their life. You know, they don't have much of a life. But to those who have been very happy to be their own sovereign, to say the only way into this kingdom is you have to admit you're not the king, you're tough, right? I've already pretty well given away the main idea of what's to come, but there's a phrase that's going to show up three times. And as we've been doing over the last several weeks, because Hebrew because you can't read the Hebrew text like we can, and, you know, like when you print something and you can put a highlight or a bold or change the color of the text or underline it to make it stick out, what Hebrew authors and poets do is one of the ways they make something vivid or stand out from the text is they repeat it so that you go, 
this might seem important. There's going to be a phrase that shows up three times, and I want you to circle it if you don't mind marking in your Bible, because this is the heartbeat of the text. This is what Daniel, God is going to use Daniel to say to King Nebuchadnezzar. This is the thing that I, he wants to say to King Nebuchadnezzar. And even though you and I probably can't relate in much of any way to the most powerful person on the planet 2,600 years ago, there is one way. And we're going to find it in the heartbeat of the interpretation of the vision. Let's read it. The tree you saw, which grew and became strong, verse 20, so that its top reached the heaven and was visible to the ends of the whole earth, whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which were the beasts of the field, found shade, and whose branches and the birds of heaven lived. It is you, O king. You have grown and become strong. Your greatness has reached to heaven, your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the beasts of the field till seven periods of time pass, for him, pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is decreed of the Most High. If you remember, that's how the chapter started. The king was making a decree, and Daniel saying, well, the one true God has a decree for you. That you shall be driven among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. You shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for, me, for you for the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins, practice righteousness, and in your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that they may perhaps a lengthening to your prosperity. All of this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar at the end of the 12 months. He was walking on the roof of his royal palace. Remember, this is bringing us back to the ease, the context of the dream. Bad things happen when very powerful people look over their kingdom. He was walking on the roof of his royal palace and the king answered. This is a year later. A year later. Let's keep that in mind. Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence for the glory of my majesty? Do you hear all the personal pronouns? I and me and my. While the words were still in his mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. You shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven period of time, periods of time will pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men to eat grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. We have no idea what's happening here. Basically, the king is being made to be a cow. I mean, that's really what's happening here. Various scholars and um, Bible interpreters wrestle with kind of our options. You know, what's really happening here? Is this a... Is this a is this really happening? Is he actually becoming a cow? Or is he retaining the features of a man and being made to eat grass? Like, like, how literal should we take this? There is actually a diagnosis for this sort of condition. People have been known to be insane, out of their minds, and found out in the fields eating, eating hay. I believe the term is boanthropy, where somebody become they think that they're an animal. They think that they're a cow of some kind or some other wild animal. And they take to the fields. And essentially what we have here, however we interpret this, is God is putting the king out to pasture because the king has not heard the word. The king has not heard the message and he's being driven from the kingdom which he mistakenly thought was his. Did you hear the phrase that came up three times? There were a lot of things that came up, but the phrase that came up three times, and if you want to look back and just put a pencil mark around it, it shows up in verse 25 and 26. 
that this will happen to you, Nebuchadnezzar, until you know that king, the kingdom of heaven rules. Until you know that God rules and not you. The message that he would have for the king, it shows up again in verse 32. It's going to show up in the last little chunk here that we haven't read yet. Is You've made the mistake, Nebuchadnezzar, when you go out to look over your mighty kingdom to think that you're the one who's ultimately done this. And not only that, but that it's ultimately done by you and for you. The thing that Nebuchadnezzar did wrong, the huge mistake he made, was not understanding that God could have put anybody on the throne. That God could have used any, three times it says, this interpretation, you're my lackey, Nebuchadnezzar. I could have put anybody on the throne. This isn't all because you're so powerful and you're so strong. Who is in fact giving you the very life breath to live? I'm doing this, Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sending you out of out into exile. I'm putting you out to pasture because you haven't gotten it through your head, even though you're the most powerful person on the earth. There's only one God who rules. There's only one God who rules. Daniel 2 said, there's only one God who reveals. Daniel 3 said, there's only one God who rescues. And I'm giving it away. There's only one God in Daniel 4 that rules. What I find that's interesting about this, to kind of bring that close to home for us, because what does that have to do with me? I'm not ruling an empire that's spanning people's tribes and languages. What, what do I and what do you possibly have in common with the most powerful person on the planet 2,600 years ago? Nebuchadnezzar is going to give the answer away in the end. Let's read how he responds to God's very hard word to him. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised him and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does according to his will among the host of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay his hand or say, what have you done? And at the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty, and my splendor, it returned to me. And God took him from turning him out to pasture and gave him the kingdom back after he learned the lesson. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. For those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Let me propose to you... And this is a hard word. It's been a hard word for me this week. That the one thing you might have in common with Nebuchadnezzar, even though you don't rule the world like he did, is the one thing that could potentially bring it all down. And that's pride. It's the P word. It's a bad word. It's that when you and I forget who's in charge, that hardwired into our gospel message, the very thing that has given us the life that we have, we can forget it. We can forget that God is in charge, that God rules heaven and earth, and not you and not I. Another way of saying it is, because I think when, when Nebuchadnezzar goes to the top of his palace, again, to have a look around, and he takes a deep breath, and he looks at his kingdom, and he says, is this not for me and, and made by me? What he's doing is he's taking credit, isn't he? He's taking credit. And God is saying, I could have put anybody on the throne. The mistake that Nebuchadnezzar makes, maybe to drive this a little bit closer to home, is that Nebuchadnezzar doesn't get to take credit for his kingdom. That the great sin that Daniel 4 is getting at for you and for I, who obviously live in very different circumstances, but the same vice is there, the vice of pride, is God wants to say to Nebuchadnezzar, and he says it very boldly and very bluntly, you are not in charge. I am. I'm the king, God says. And you don't get to take credit for your life, for what you've built. Now, I know I don't own a palace, but there's times when I walk out to the beautiful acre and a half that we live on, and I, I praise God for it. I thank God for it. And yet... There's always just that little whisper in my ear 
saying, look at what you've done, Marcus. This is so beautiful because you've made it, you and Carrie, and the, it's beautiful because it's yours and you've made it beautiful. And there's some degree of truth to that. But if I don't hear the roaring voice over the top of that whisper of pride that says, this is mine, this is mine. And I could have given this to anybody. In fact, I could give it to people that probably would take care of it and make it look more beautiful than even you. That you and I don't get to take credit for everything that we are and everything that we have. And to some of you, that's a real big relief. Praise God I don't get to take credit because it's a, there's not much there. But I warn you that if you have a lot, and you find yourself going out to walk out on your deck or out onto your lawn and you find yourself saying, look at what I've done. You're, in vain, you're on very dangerous ground. Bad things happen to kings when they walk on the roofs of their palaces. The thing that unites you and I, and I've said it a lot already, is pride with Nebuchadnezzar. C.S. Lewis says it much better than I do. He has a very short little paragraph in Mere Christianity where he calls pride the great sin. <clears throat> he says, in God, you come up against something which is in every respect immeasurably superior to you. Okay, just say it, C.S. Lewis. Just say it. Unless you know God and that as that, and therefore know yourself as nothing in comparison, you do not know God at all. As long as you're proud, you cannot know God. A proud man is always looking down on things and people. And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see something that is above you. I want you to get your communion ready, if you can find it. Did you hear the phrase in Nebuchadnezzar's response? It says it twice. And when a Hebrew author says something more than once, it means... Pay attention. Nebuchadnezzar, after the seven periods of time pass over him, says twice, my reason returned to me. Literally, I went from being insane to coming back to myself. And when he comes back to himself, what is the most reasonable thing that he does before God? He praises him. He worships him. I want to propose to you this morning that as you and I are both trying to get that pill down our throat, swallow that very challenging truth that God is king and we are not, that one of the beautiful, practical benefits of worshiping God every week, let alone Monday through Saturday, is praising God is literally a habit that brings you... It's the most sane thing you can do. It's the most sane thing you can do every week, which is to say to God, you are God, and I will praise you. And I am not. And so as we take communion this morning, I want to encourage you to get that little piece of bread out. And let's remember the king, the real king. It's not us. And it's not Nebuchadnezzar. It's Jesus. Let's take this little piece of bread that Jesus gave us to remind ourselves and to do the most sane thing we might do all week. To say, you're the king, Jesus, and I'm not. And by taking the piece of bread... You're pledging that. You're saying that to him and to yourself. Let's take that piece of bread together in communion. And then go ahead and peel that second layer back. Let's take the juice and let's remember that the one who is the king led us into his kingdom, made it possible to come into his kingdom, showed us the insanity of a life that says, I'm the king, God, and you're not, that there had to be blood spilled for us to be a part of this kingdom. We didn't get into this kingdom because we're so great, and we look around and we say, look at what I've done. We're a part of this kingdom because blood was shed on our behalf. So let's drink the juice to remember the blood that was shed that led us into his kingdom. The beautiful and challenging truth of Daniel 4 is that God is the only God who rules. That's what he wanted to say to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's what he wants to say to you and I. That you and I, if we're really coming to God, what we're saying is, is 
I don't get to, and I don't want to take credit for my life. My life is the result of you and your grace and your power. And while that is a very hard pill to swallow at times, it's also the best piece of news you could ever receive. So let's pray. Lord, we, we don't even know <laughs> the pride in our hearts. Um, it's such a quiet whisper. It's so strong. So we know that you're, you're merciful now even when we're not even, we're not even sure of the things. We're t we don't even know the things we're taking for granted and, and the places that our pride is ass asserting its power in our lives. We do know you've made us to be a part of your kingdom and that when we really come to you, Jesus, what we're saying is, is you're the king and I hand over my allegiance. And so I pray for the people here that have really done that. They've really said, you're the king, God, and I'm not. And I pray that you would continue to touch their heart with that and Help them experience the joy and the freedom of that. To remember that this week. I pray for those of us today who, that's a, that's a hard word. And maybe they haven't said, you know, Jesus, you're the king and I'm not. And, and that's a hard word. That sticks in the throat. I, I pray that you'd, um, maybe this week, help show them how insane it is to think that we are in charge, that we are the king, and that the only way our reason could return to us as it did to Nebuchadnezzar is to see the truth, that you're the only one who rules. You're the only one who gets to take the credit. So I pray for those of us this week who are, haven't said that word, haven't made that allegiance, and I pray that by your grace, maybe you bring somebody into their life that has like the spirit of Daniel. They're not arrogant, they're not proud, they're not seeking to rub our faces in it, they're burdened. They, they, they're, it's a heavy word. It's a heavy word to say to somebody, I've got good news and I've got bad news. That's a heavy word. I pray you'd bring that person into their life this week that has that humble spirit because that's a hard word. It's a hard message. We love you, Lord. We're so thankful to be together. And we know we're going back out into a world that's just crumbling and falling apart. We ask you to use us to point people to your ultimate sovereignty and power. It's in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's have our worship team come up and close us out. And as they're doing so, um, I want to just remind you that Jesus uses a very similar message, doesn't he, in Matthew 13, when he says, his kingdom is like a mustard seed. And it's so small, you couldn't even see it. But a farmer plants it in his field and over time it grows and what's the image after that the birds come and nest in its branches it's the same image that nebuchadnezzar sees except it's not nebuchadnezzar's kingdom it's jesus's kingdom is the ultimate kingdom that will never be cut down never stripped of its bark never thrown in the fire never left with a band of iron around it and by his grace we're a part of that kingdom god's an awesome god and there's no one like him We've seen that God is the only God that reveals. God's the only God that rescues. And now we've seen that God's the only God that rules. Let's go out and know we've got good news. And we've got some bad news. But it's the best news you could ever have that would set you free to live in his kingdom. Go out this week and, and remember you don't get to take credit for your life. Everything you are and everything you have it's God's. Let's go out and enjoy that incredible truth this week. There's only one God that rules. It's the one true God. Have a great week. God bless you. Please leave your chairs where they are. We've got a crew that's going to pick those up. If you got your connection card and your offering envelopes, go ahead and put those in the box before you go. Have a great week. Thanks so much for coming. We'll see you next week, same time, same place. God bless you.